My name is Xiao Liman. I'm a faculty at the study department here, and uh, I'm here to uh, introduce my friend and uh, classmate back from China, uh, Professor Jin Qing uh, Fan. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Professor Yao, for organizing uh, this uh, extremely timely meeting. And as we all know, that big data is everywhere, and now uh, we have a lot to do. And it's great to see a group of uh, very diverse uh, researchers here all talk about uh, big data. Um, speaking of big data, I think um, I was thinking about how to introduce uh, uh, my friend Chen Qing Fan because he has had so many titles, have done so many works that in the end I find the best way to introduce him is to ask you to do some data mining work to find out what he has done. Uh, he has done, done really, I mean he has probably six titles at this moment so I'm not going to, uh, you can easily uh, Google to find, find him but all I want to say is that he is a faculty at the Princeton University and uh, um, he has done many, many works, particularly in big data, even before big, big data was a fancy term. And uh, so you can look at the, the long history, the things he has done. Um, most recently, he and I, we were both in China at Fudan University where we graduated. Both of us were asked to give talks on big data. So I heard uh, a talk he did on big data and I learned a paper he wrote, which I highly recommend to all of you. Uh, I think its title is The Challenges in Big Data, is that literally? Mm -hmm. The reason I, it, it's a really terrific article. Um, it's probably not that easy to find. You need to go to get on his webpage because it's published in this uh, Chinese uh, journal called the Nature, uh, Science. It's the Science of Nature, the, the, the Chinese Nature. Review, yeah. Right. But it's, uh, the article is, on, is in English, and uh, uh, the reason I said it's a great article because I read it, I was quite inspired by it, inspired by it is he listed these four major problems from a statistical perspective that we have to pay attention to. Uh, one of them I think he's going to spend, maybe two of them he's going to spend time to talk about today. Um, as we, you know, we, we all know the big data bring us a lot of information, but we can't forget that big data also bring us a lot of noise. And uh, uh, all we do in a, in a very short term is we're all trying to separate uh, noise from the data from the information. And sometimes it just looks something extremely strong, but turn out to be really noise. And I think that's the topic uh, Jin Qing is going to talk about. So let's uh, welcome Jin Qing. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Xiao Li, for a very nice uh, introduction. Uh, and I would like to also to uh, take this opportunity to thank conference organizers, prof uh, particularly Professor Yao, for, in uh, for inviting me here. So uh, as Shelly just introduced, right, so we all rush into uh, big data mining and uh, certainly we have true discovery and we have false discovery. And today I just you know, have fun just to you know, talk a little bit in advance what is about false uh, discovery. And uh, uh, so here is basically the outline of my talk. I'll talk about spears correlation. And uh, I, when I came here, I thought there may be a lot of mathematicians here. So I said, hey, well, what is related to random geometry? Uh, and now I'll talk about distribution of uh, maximum spears correlations. And uh, to get that correlation, I'll talk about uh, multiplier bootstrap. Uh, and then I'll do some uh, application to high dimensional statistical inference and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> So uh, let me begin with an uh, introduction uh, about Spears correlation and the London geometry. So, uh, well, I mean, data tsunami is no news to the audience here that the large and complex data arise routinely from uh, biological science, engineering, natural science, and uh, social science. And we have seen two examples of economics uh, in the uh, previous uh, session. And uh, big data is everywhere, right? so from government data to internet data uh, to engineering, social science, and so on. And uh, we also increase not only in complexity, but also in size of, of the data as er evident in the chart uh, down below. So uh, in response, so over the last two decades, uh, many exciting data mining, statistical machine learning techniques has been introduced. Right, so uh, uh, two examples that uh, statistician contribute to the, to the method is like lasso and uh, scat. Uh, so these are techniques uh, are introduced to associate uh, covariates with, uh, uh, to help select uh, a set of covariates from a large pool of sets. Now the question we ask, can our discovery be uh, spurious? How do we know our discovery is any better than chance? Uh, and uh, 
of course, in making these discoveries, large big data, big assumptions, right? we made a lot of assumptions. Are assumptions verifiable? So these are the two um, statistical or mathematical issues that I would like to talk uh, today. So in order to illustrate uh, the talk, so I pick a, a question at random, uh, so you could take any other data sets. So I took uh, the data sets of gene expression of uh, 19 Asians from the International uh, HabMap Project. So in other words, I have 90 uh, microarray gene expressions. And uh, I take one of the genes, which relate to uh, nicotine, uh, as, uh, as my response, why, and just trying to see which covariates uh, actually are associated with that particular gene. So, uh, so in other words, response is one of those uh, uh, genes and uh, the, the covariate is the remaining of, uh, of the genes. So uh, in this case, indeed, I mean, more precisely, it's really the probe used to, uh, the, uh, the probe rather than gene, but uh, for simplicity, I'll say in genes. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> so I apply lasso uh, to the best knowledge I can. So uh, I apply lasso, use uh, tenfold cross validation, and at the end of the day, lasso pick 25 genes. So in other words, among 47,000 or so uh, probes or genes, I pick 25 of them, which we, I think is related to this particular uh, 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 expression of the genes. Uh, and uh, now I just want to see how good the prediction is, right? So I compute the correlation of lasso fit and uh, my response, right? So the fitted value based on data mining or lasso technique uh, and the correlation is 0.9. So it's a wonderful fit, right? So the fitted value and true value is 90% correlation. And uh, if I do a little bit without using Lasso's uh, shrinkage, but just using Lasso's selected 25 genes, and they run just ordinary multiple regression, least square F regression, so this is typically called post Lasso. Uh, I use PL to uh, substitute that. So in other words, I only use those 25 gene information and then rerun the regression and I got a fitted value, and now I compute a fitted value with, uh, with the response. So it's wonderful, uh, even 0.92. Correlation is as high as 0.92. So it sounds very high. Now my question is very simple. Uh, is this discovery any better than chance? So in other words, if these 48 uh, uh, 47,000 genes was just a random sample, held nothing whatsoever, right? So it's just a Gaussian random numbers, right? Can I associate with the response why? Uh, just as good or even better than what you get here, right? So in other words, I'm asking, is discovery any better than chance? So in other words, if y has no relationship with x whatsoever, just the fact that you have uh, choose 25 from this many is an uh, astronomical number of choices, right? So by this uh, fact alone, can you get uh, a correlation even better than 0.92, right? So it can be better than 0.92, you cannot prove with certainty or with reasonable statistical certainty that uh, uh, the discovery is genuine or is real. So in order to answer this question, I need to know the distribution, the reference distribution, right? That is, under the null hypothesis, if x and y are completely independent, uh, if, uh, so uh, what, is the, what is the distribution of this uh, Spears uh, correlation? And this uh, reference distribution, depending on uh, what is the sample size, uh, how many genes you choose from, and how many you choose, right? Uh, and the, of course, the dependence among covariates uh, itself. So this is uh, the distribution that I'm going to, uh, to uh, give you uh, today. So uh, to answer, uh, this is just the, the answer that I'll tell you, right? So this is the 0.92 uh, that we get, right? The, the fitted value of 0.92 that we get. And this is the reference distribution that I refer to. Uh, I will show you is this is the reference distribution. By looking at this reference distribution, you can see that uh, your discovery is no better than, uh, than chance, right? So, uh, so this is, uh, but if you do less ambitious, let's say, for example, if I only choose three genes rather than taking a bigger uh, penalty parameter so that you only choose three genes, so uh, now your, uh, your 
uh, I mean, fitted the value, doing the same calculation, 0.92 here, uh, would become 0.67 uh, also. And uh, this is, again, the reference distribution for that particular example. If I take, instead of s equal to 25, but take s equal to 3, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, the discovery now you can claim at least is uh, better than, uh, than chance. So, uh, the, so the question, uh, uh, what we basically want to say is that, uh, <clears throat> right, I mean, so uh, big data, uh, in the big data analysis, we also make a big data assumptions, right? A few fundamental assumptions that we made and we forget and may not necessarily even true. The first one probably seems to me very, uh, very serious one is homogeneity, right? So homogeneity, uh, I mean, we always assume the data as if it comes from one sample, uh, one population, but in fact, it comes from many, many populations, right? The second one probably is uh, Gaussianity or sub-Gaussianity, light tails. Uh, I mean, because many measurements that we use are typically very rough, and it's, uh, the reality is far, from, uh, far away from, uh, let's say, gene expression, far away from Gaussian assumptions. And the, the, the third one, and I'm going to do a testable uh, statistical object, is, uh, is uh, uh, exogeneity. That is, uh, you assume that the part cannot be predicted by covariates, are independent or uncorrelated with, uh, with uh, the, all the covariates. And by chance alone, since I have 47,000 of them, you could easily imagine this assumption is often uh, violated, right? So, uh, so my question is, are those assumptions uh, uh, verifiable, right? So uh, again, uh, if I want to verify the last, uh, the, uh, the last assumption, right? So the typical tool what we get is the lesson we learn from statistics, right? So that is, we get the residuals, right? So let me get the residuals from the lasso fit or the post lasso fit. And now I just calculate the empirical correlation of uh, of each covariates with uh, my uh, empirical correlation of each covariates with my residuals, right? So I would get 47,000 of those uh, uh, sample correlations. And 47 uh, of those uh, sample correlation is, uh, I just show you here in the plot, right? So this is the, uh, the residuals based on lasso fit, and this is 47,000 covariates I plot here. And the, the distribution that uh, you get, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, the distribution I put down is here, right? So the, in other words, this would be the distribution of uh, those 47,000 covariates with, uh, with the epsilon. Uh, and this, uh, and the, if, uh, if the assumption was hold, that is, if this assumption was hold, and we could in theoretically derive what is the null distribution. The null distribution, just like what we most, most of you are familiar with, is normal distribution with, uh, with uh, variance one over n. So it's the green picture here. Right? From here, we can easily see that the assumption that we made uh, is violated. Right? So the, I mean, the, uh, there's a certainly over dispersion uh, very, very clearly seen uh, from uh, this picture. Uh, and the, of course, there's a lot of mathematics for us to do, right? So to derive that distribution uh, for correlated x does take some efforts. Right? <clears throat> and the, the issue that I'm talking here, actually, interestingly, also relate to uh, the random geometry, right? So when we talk about correlation between two covariates of sample size n, right? So it's just an inner product of two vectors in n-dimensional space, right? So now in, for my particular application, I have uh, y is one vector of response in n-dimensional n sphere, and uh, any covariates, uh, any, uh, one covariate would be one point in n-dimensional uh, sphere, right? So, so, uh, so then I have p covariates, 47,000 of them. So it's really like I throw 47,000 points at random on the sphere, and then my question was, what is the maximum sphere's correlation really the same question as what is the minimum angle that I could have, right? So this is uh, what is the minimum angle I could get. Uh, if I throw n points at random, what is the minimum angle to the North Pole I could get? This is the same uh, uh, question. Of course, if you are interested in <laughs> other related to random geometry, you could ask, hey, what is the empirical distribution of those angles, right? So I have 47,000 of well, I have 47,000 points, so I have 47,000 of those 
uh, uh, angles. What is the empirical uh, distribution of those angles, right? And if you ask like more, you could ask, hey, what is the empirical distribution of all those pairwise uh, angles, right? So you could ask more. So, so we do have some kind of uh, mathematical results on this, but this is probably not the talk today. And the talk today if, uh, is not talking about spirit correlation using one variable. You could be have spirit correlation using two variables, right? So I use two variables to predict the outcome, right? Uh, so uh, I use the best two variables to predict the outcome. So this is, this is equivalent to say that I pick two points on the sphere, and there, I mean, and together with the origin, they, they form uh, a plane. And, uh, and now what is the minimum principal angle, right? So and I have P choose two. So this is really the maximum spirit correlation I'm talking about. Uh, so if I, amount, I choose two best subset to predict the noise, uh, how large imperial correlation I can get among uh, S equal to two, right? So this is uh, uh, two dimension, and today my talk is more than two dimension, and not only on the sphere, actually it's more, more general, right? Ellipse, right? So that my question is, covariates usually are correlated, so the, my question is, if I throw n points on an ellipse, uh, right, uh, what is the, uh, the minimum principal angles uh, 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 among P choose two, right? So in uh, S uh, dimensional uh, 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 space. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about what is the joint distribution. And the more precisely quantity, I probably already confused you, uh, is the line they probably are looking at, at this. This is the, uh, the most important quantity, right? So if uh, the covariates and the response, uh, let's say I use epsilon in this case, is completely uh, independent, statistically, uh, probability called in independent, uh, and I use the best linear combination of S variables, right? So I choose best S variable to predict the noise. How big, how good the prediction I could get? I, 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 I denote this quantity as a uh, maximum spirit correlation, right? So it depending on sample size, depending on how many I choose from, uh, how many I chose and how many I choose from, uh, as well as how correlated, what is the coherence matrix of uh, this sigma. So this is the distribution, reference distribution I'm talking about today. Okay, so, uh, so in order to give you an idea, uh, so I just do simulations, so probably give you a, a, a better idea what is, the, uh, what is the quantity I'm studying uh, today, right? So I simulate, uh, let's say, n sample from independent normal distribution, uh, from normal distribution, uh, I mean, I, I did from normal distribution, uh, and uh, we cover sigma, and it's independent of the noise. Noise is also from normal. And uh, I want to compute the maximum spirit correlation. As I said, it should depend on four quantities, right? Uh, uh, for, I mean, 1,000 dimensional problems. So I have 1,000 variables I choose from. And I may choose one variable, choose two, five, and 10, right? And the sample size also varies. <clears throat> and uh, in this case, I consider two, uh, two I mean, covariance matrix. One is identity. The other is block diagonal. First 500 is equal correlation matrix with a correlation 0.8. The next 500 is identity matrix. So the condition number in this case is over 2,000. Okay, uh, the, over 4,000. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the condition number. So it's uh, is very uh, uh, irregular distribution. <clears throat> and what I'm showing you here is the distribution of the spheres correlation for sample size equal to 50, 100, and 200. Right. And this is for S, the, uh, the number of variable I choose from, the, uh, the, the, uh, the number of variable I choose from is one uh, or, two, or uh, two or five or 10, right? So this is uh, S from uh, one, two, and 10. As you see, the uh, spirit correlation increasing very quickly to one as if you fix the sample size, right? But just increase the number of variable that you choose, uh, you choose from. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, and then as sample size is getting bigger, spheres correlation gets smaller, as that's what we really uh, all expect to see. And what is really interesting and surprised me is, even though these two matrices are so different, uh, so the, the distribution actually they doesn't look so, so different, right? So the condition number here is uh, 4,000, the condition number here is only one, right? So it's very different, uh, two matrices, and uh, it looks quite similar uh, for this particular distribution. <coughs> So now uh, let's talk about the uh, mathematical formulation of what is the distribution of maximum spirit correlation, and then I'll talk about uh, applications. 
uh, again, the uh, an important reminder is uh, an important reminder is the definition, right? So definition is the maximum spheres correlation is uh, if x and epsilon are independent, and I choose uh, s variable, the best s variable, and trying to best predict epsilon, and what is the maximum spheres correlation I get, right? So this is the spheres correlation I have. And uh, to make uh, the theoretical foundation more rigorous, I assume that data are uh, really an independent sample copy from a population with, uh, I mean, variant sigma and the covariance, uh, this capital sigma. So, so far I haven't assumed what the distribution yet. I just think I need the variance to be finite, right? <clears throat> And uh, because the correlation is scale invariant, right? So I could assume without loss of generality, sigma equal to one, and this sigma is the correlation matrix, right? So, uh, so this is uh, due to scaling. And uh, so what we are going to consider today is the, uh, is the, uh, the sub-Gaussian uh, distribution. So we really just uh, say that uh, X is a sub-Gaussian distribution and epsilon is a sub-Gaussian distribution. So this is the only condition that actually we, uh, we required. And this is the definition of sub-Gaussian distribution. So we assume sub-Gaussian norm, which is defined here, which is really LQ norm, just normalized by uh, square root of Q, right? One over square root of Q. Uh, so this is finite, so K0 will use. K1 is for, uh, now is a, this is a p-dimensional vector, so it's the best linear, uh, projection uh, is, uh, is finite. So this is uh, the, the one condition that we, uh, we uh, impose. And then uh, for coherence matrix, we also impose some condition. Indeed, we, we really do not impose condition. We just really uh, say, examine what is the impact of coherence matrices. And you'll see the impact of coherence matrices is probably not that high. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so this is the, uh, we define uh, the, uh, the minimum uh, eigenvalue among all submatrices, no other than S, right? So this is, uh, uh, sigma is P by P, let's say 47,000 by 47,000, let's say S is uh, 10, and uh, I'm talking about the uh, minimum eigenvalue of all those submatrix, uh, no more than uh, order 10, and this is the, uh, I use the notation psi minimum, and the similarly, psi maximum is the maximum eigenvalue of all the no more than 10 uh, sub matrices. And uh, uh, so the S uh, sparse conditioning number is the maximum divided by minimum that we, we will use. And in the mathematical formulation, we also allow S to be diverged with N and P. So, uh, so in other words, everything could grow to uh, infinity. So S had to be going much slower than uh, sample size N. And uh, so, the, uh, so now we could characterize the asymptotic distribution of the maximum spheres correlation. Uh, so I denote uh, Z to be a vector of normal uh, random variable with mean zero and the cohen sigma. So this is standard normal distribution. And S is all, uh, I mean, all the vectors in the unit uh, sphere, uh, in the unit sphere the, uh, with only S, uh, S elements uh, not equal to zero. And the first thing I'm basically saying that uh, uh, the, the maximum spheres correlation and uh, the, the theoretical distribution that defined by this random variable here, so they are approximately uh, converged to, uh, to zero. Okay, so, uh, and the, what is the distribution that we would like to, uh, to see here is the supremum of Gaussian process indexed by alpha. Uh, and uh, so how do we define this, right? So Z is a random variable, a normal random variable. So this is defined uh, for any index alpha in here. So you just take the maximum value of this, right? So this is the same as, as uh, this definition, but this is probably uh, not important. So in other words, uh, we basically show theoretically the distribution, uh, the, the distribution I want, if I suitably normalize by square root of n, would be close to the supremum of this Gaussian process. And this Gaussian process certainly depends on sigma, which is still unknown, but, uh, uh, but we'll estimate it. But before we estimate it, so let me give you uh, some uh, insights that we get. So the technical proofs rely on Gaussian approximation by uh, recent wonderful work of uh, Chernozhukov and his collaborators. <clears throat> 
So, uh, so, the, uh, so let me take a, a very special case and actually uh, it, uh, say a lot. Right? So special case is isotropic case. That is the random geometry I say at very early beginning. So if you throw uh, P points uh, uniformly at, uh, at random on the sphere, so what is the maximum uh, sphere's correlation of uh, uh, S uh, choose from P? Uh, well, we say this is really the same as the uh, the sum of the uh, reverse order statistic of chi-square distribution. So if you have an um, uh, independent chi-square distribution, uh, so, the, uh, so what is the maximum spheres correlation? I basically say the maximum spheres correlation have the same distribution as the, uh, the order statistic of uh, independent chi-square uh, distribution. So if you sum up the S largest uh, order statistics is the same as the maximum spheres uh, correlation. So as a consequence, we know that uh, the order of maximum spheres correlation when you suitable normalize by square root of n is the same as the, right, is the same distribution as the maximum uh, uh, as sum of the largest S uh, order statistics or chi-square distribution, that is the normal squared uh, random variable, right? So this is of order, actually, uh, what I prescribe uh, uh, here. And in particular, if uh, the first graph I show you on the random geometry, what is the minimum angle using one variables? So this, uh, in this case, is have a distribution uh, close to, uh, I mean, gamble uh, dis uh, distribution. And uh, in addition, our theory doesn't really have to focus on independent between x and epsilon. Uh, x and epsilon independent can be relaxed to uncorrelated plus a few conditional moments uh, conditions. Uh, so this, uh, this would be uh, sufficient for our technical results. And uh, the next thing I want to, uh, to say is the, uh, the joint asymptotic. Just for curiosity, uh, you may ask, uh, what is the, uh, I mean, what is the distribution of uh, maximum spheres correlation if I use only one variables? That is, if I want to predict noise, choosing the best one variables. If I want to predict noise, choosing the best two variables. So using two variables is always better than using one variables, right? So the difference is increments I put down here. And the similarly, uh, what is the, uh, I mean, the maximum spirit correlation using S variables and the S minus one uh, variables. So these are the, in, uh, right, the increments that I plot here. Uh, what, is, what are those increments? And we basically say if you suitably normalize by square root of n, because everything squared, now it's become uh, normalized by n, uh, so it would be uh, the same uh, distribution as the, I mean, as the, uh, order study of, of chi-square disp uh, distribution, reverse order study of chi-square distribution. So in other words, when you, I suitable normalize, this is the distribution of uh, the first, uh, I mean, chi-square order, chi order statistics, and the increments here is the second uh, chi-square distribution, uh, uh, second order study of chi-square distribution, and, and so on. So this is basically categorize what are the uh, what are the, uh, the maximum spheres correlation uh, uh, can do from probabilistic point of view. Now from statistical point of view, I really want to, uh, right, I want to get the distribution and I cannot use chi-square distribution unless I know that my sigma is identity here, right? So in general, the general distribution is here depending on, on unknown sigma. So a natural way people would do is doing uh, a bootstrap approximation. And the multiply bootstrap is really just a bootstrap approximation, but just a, a very specific way of simulating the, boost, uh, the bootstrap uh, distribution. So, uh, so the, as I said, the theoretical quantity is defined by this, right? The distribution of this max supremum of this uh, maximum Gaussian process, which depending on uh, first of all, this distribution is not easy, not, not easy, not analytically uh, being calculated. Only unless s equal to one, I could calculate it. In general, I cannot calculate it. Uh, secondly, it depends on unknown uh, z. And uh, uh, so the, in order to get that distribution, uh, I need to, uh, I mean, to do bootstrap. So bootstrap is very simple. Basically, uh, I mean, replace this unknown covariance by sample covariance, unknown covariance here by sample covariance matrix, right? So in other words, I simulate from this distribution using sample covariance matrix, 
And uh, this simulation is the same as calculating this way. So it just generate independent, an independent normal distribution and then multiply in front of it. And you could easily show that this Z hat have this uh, distribution, right? So because of this reason, people just give a name called multiplier bootstrap, but it's just really just a simulation computation to compute uh, this uh, distribution. Uh, so once you get that distribution, uh, then you could compute your Gaussian process, right? So this is your uh, Gaussian process based on simulated data. And now you just calculate the supremum of this Gaussian uh, process, and you get, uh, 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 you get uh, uh, your uh, multiplier bootstrap uh, uh, distribution. And uh, of course, it's always uh, a question, uh, a few questions arises, right? Uh, how do I compute that? Right? So if you think about it, it's a horrible computation. Uh, but the, nevertheless, we show you the picture, we might be able to calculate it very greedily, right? So how do we calculate this, right? So first of all, uh, uh, just from the very early beginning, right? So we have uh, I mean, if I ask, what is the maximum spirit correlation? So it's 47,000, I choose 25. That's a huge number of calculation. This is always nowadays, uh, I mean, uh, nowadays uh, challenging uh, issues. How do I calculate uh, the, uh, I mean, how do I do uh, these kind of uh, calculation, right? So like best subset selections. And we use a very greedy algorithm to accomplish that. So uh, first is we use what's so-called a step by addition, right? So you add in one variable at a time, uh, and uh, until, let's say, I add to some point, let's say, until I add to uh, 40, uh, 40 best variables, and then we prune back. Then we use, uh, do whatever, a branch and bound. So it's just D choose S variables. Uh, so this always provides an, a, a lower bound for the uh, maximum spirits correlation. So, but, and we believe this lower bound is very close to, uh, to the, uh, to the truth. So in other words, what we are calculating is using a very greedy algorithm like step uh, addition to grow to certain points and then choose, uh, choose the best among those 40, uh, 40 choose uh, S. So this is uh, 40 choose 25 to accomplish our calculation. And uh, the next uh, results basically saying that, uh, uh, that uh, the multiplier bootstrap uh, does work, right? So uh, basically saying that the multiplier bootstrap and the theoretical distribution we have and the multiplier uh, bootstrap we have here uh, is, uh, is, uh, is close. So this is basically just a, a few technical conditions. Now with all those distributions, now we are ready to go back and revisit the issue that we uh, erased at very early beginning. And indeed, you already seen the picture, right? So uh, the question we asked at the very early beginning is, uh, is our fit any better or far, uh, than, than just, uh, is our discovery any better than, by, uh, than discovered by chance? So we had a fitted value based on the data, right? And we use, uh, let's say, S predictors. Right? Uh, and, uh, and now we calculate uh, the correlation between your fitted value and uh, your observed value. And now we compare with the quantile of this maximum spirit correlation uh, here, the quantile maximum spirit correlation here, right? So this is the point 92 in the example I said at very early beginning. And this is the, the distribution of maximum spirit correlation. And if I compare this, I know that uh, the discovery is no better than chance. So for another occasion that I choose uh, uh, a bigger uh, regularization parameters, so, uh, so that I only discover three genes that relate to one thing that relate uh, to my response variables. And in this case, uh, my, uh, my fitted correlation, this uh, fitted correlation is about 0.7. And uh, the 95 percentile of Spears correlation is this. So then I know that discovery is uh, better than chance, right? And uh, uh, so the other thing uh, that we, said was, let's say, the big assumption in, uh, in sparse, high-dimensional sparse linear models. And uh, uh, so one of the biggest assumptions is that we assume exogeneity, right? So uh, all uh, epsilon and x uh, equal to uncorrelated in this uh, sparse linear model. And remember, in this sparse linear, linear model, epsilon is not a random noise, right? Epsilon is just a part cannot be explained by the variable that you select, right? So epsilon is just the difference between these two. So, uh, so, uh, so for example, let's say, uh, let's say for example, unknown to us, 
uh, two genes are responsible for the, the, resp uh, the, uh, the, the output, uh, the clinical outcome in this particular way. And the classical linear model continue to hold, right? So this is, let's say this is the ideal model we had, but we do not know the identity of which two genes. So therefore, just like a classical uh, technique, right? We do uh, netting, right? So we, uh, we collected many, 47,000 of them in this particular case. And uh, just, uh, so we collected a lot of them just by chance alone some of those variables right, are related to, X, uh, to epsilon because, uh, I mean, epsilon just equal to this, right? So if arcing this P equal to zero is a lot of assumptions, right? Uh, so uh, so uh, asking this to be equal to zero is, has a lot of assumptions. And uh, what we really do here, uh, yeah, so, I mean, technically, we could easily uh, believe this assumption cannot be uh, valid. And uh, you know, can that, uh, now, now the question we ask ourselves is, can we actually provide evidence this kind of assumption uh, does not valid? Uh, so this is uh, a hypothesis testing uh, issues. So now hypothesis is this equal to zero, right? Then alternative hypothesis is some of these are not equal to uh, zero. But the logically, it, it'd be very easy to imagine that uh, asking the variable that you collect without any control to be uncorrelated with this epsilon uh, is a lot of assumption to us, right? Because many covariates you collect is related to y, and therefore epsilon just by chance alone would be uh, related to uh, this, uh, this particular uh, uh, epsilon. So now, are there any evidence? So this is the evidence that I show you, right? So this is, uh, if the, um, I could tell, if there the exhaustion is, uh, if there uh, exhaustion, if the is now hypothesis is true, then I could use lasso and the conventional statistical technique, and then I could uh, I could uh, get in the residuals, and I will have a distribution blue one here. And uh, now, if there, I mean, if the assumption now assumption here is true, I also have theoretical reference distribution. Theoretical reference distribution is here, and now the question is, how can I? Uh, can I tell this is different? It's very obvious for this particular example, right? They are very, very different based on 47,000 of those histograms. They are very, 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 very uh, different. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, there's also uh, work uh, we need to do, right? The first work is really to show that uh, the empirical distribution, the empirical distribution of the correlation that I draw here, the green one that I draw here, uh, the green one, the, uh, the, so the, uh, the blue one I draw here, uh, under the null hypothesis, should go to the uh, normal distribution, right? So this is some work that you need to do, and uh, because uh, all those x, all those correlation are, are, I mean, uh, are, uh, are dependence, so therefore you, uh, you still have some work to do. And now the, the second issue may ask is the observed difference, uh, is, uh, is different, is real or by chance? I mean, from picture, it's very clear. Blue one is very different from green one. Now, the question, theoretically, are there, uh, the difference here is explainable by just uh, chance. And this, uh, this would be resolved to classical test statistics, right? So this is the theoretical reference distribution, and this is the, uh, the empirical distribution of the, these blue ones uh, here. Uh, uh, so it's the uh, L2 distance, uh, L infinite distance between these two uh, density functions, uh, distribution functions and uh, uh, or the Kramer Vermeer's test, which is L2 uh, distance, or you could just use in this uh, other kind of uh, test statistics. And uh, so if you use the maximums of the spheres correlation uh, as a test statistics, like, L, uh, like a Q equal to infinity here, uh, if you use maximum of uh, this order uh, statistics as a test statistics, and this T4, the distribution is exactly what we derived. Right? So what we derive is that if I use only one variable to predict y, what is the maximum uh, spheres uh, correlation? So this would be uh, one application uh, to test whether, uh, I mean, uh, uh, whether the uh, exogenous uh, assumption holds or not. So for our particular example, uh, if I uh, uh, apply this, uh, for our particular example, if I apply this, 
Uh, so this is the uh, critical variety. This is your observed statistics. This is critical variety. This is your observed statistics, right? So it's, even though I use a very, not very powerful, indeed a pretty weak uh, test statistic, I'm still able to uh, reject the null hypothesis that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, exogenary assumption holds. So in other words, uh, so many discovery, the assumption that we rely on, many discovery that, uh, that we uh, rely on, uh, the assumption cannot be validated. Like uh, the fundamental assumption, lasso and many variable selection as, uh, technique as, uh, based upon cannot be validated by using, uh, b uh, by the, from the data and can also not uh, really validate it from philosophical or just uh, uh, I mean, point of view. Uh, so these basically uh, uh, combine uh, together. And now I have further uh, extensions. It's just a further details to sparse linear models. You need to make some adjustment. Uh, if epsilon is not, uh, if epsilon is not directly observed, but it's from the residuals uh, of certain fit, which is what we really use. And uh, so I'm not going to detail on that. I know I run out of time. So let me just go to, so all these basically show that our, uh, I mean, bootstrap distribution and theoretical distribution are very close. So again, it's just one sentence probably is enough. And this just repeat application we had. So let me give you a, a summary of what I have said in the last 45 minutes. So we basically develop a non-asymptotic uh, and asymptotic, as well as joint asymptotic theories for maximum spirit correlations. And we use this, uh, uh, we use and validate, uh, uh, we use uh, multi uh, prior bootstrap to approximate uh, these maximum spears correlations. And we validate uh, that such, uh, such an approximation is, uh, holds. And uh, we extend the theory to high dimensional sparse linear models. Uh, we use residuals rather than observe directly the epsilon. And we, um, one of those applications is to detect whether our discovery is spurious or real. And uh, we also use it to uh, validate the popular assumption on uh, exogeneity. And that's all what I want to say. Thank you. <clears throat> So you say I just uh, excluding those 25 and then using y and those x again. I'm pretty, yeah, you could do. I'm pretty sure you still discover something. Uh, discover something. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. I, I agree. But no, there are so many. I agree you know, that this is a very reasonable philosophy. But there's a, an issue is what is the regularization parameter you choose, right? If you, uh, let's say if I use 10 fold cross validation again, it may choose something again, right? So if you say I choose a very big uh, penalty parameter, they may choose not, right? So, uh, so there's a, in, in applying a lasso, there's a, there's a, a range of model that you, a, a solution path that you can have, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, another thing I want to t tell here is more than hypothesis testing is, uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, yeah uh, the, another one I want to, uh, to do hypothesis, um, to do here is like, uh, okay, my, I mean, my fitted correlation is 0.92, or in other occasions, if my sample size, by the way, is, uh, is not 90, but 900, maybe this, that's uh, fitted uh, correlation may be much less, let's say 0.5. I want to see how 0.5, how big 0.5 in reference to the maximum spirit correlation, right? So if maximum spirit correlation is only 0.3, I feel pretty happy. But if maximum spirit correlation is 0.7 or 0.6, you know, it just gives you that the idea that your fitting is not much better than, than just, you know, I mean, the, X, the association between X and Y is not much better than chance. That's the key point that actually that I was trying to deliver. Your example actually is an interesting point oh. because the null hypothesis actually rejected because your 
so that is on the other side of the tail. Mm -hmm. So, how, I mean, this, how do you in interpret that? That seems like it's saying it's, it's deliberately less than the maximum correlation. Because you, you always mm -hmm. look at the right tail. Right. It's actually mm -hmm. rejected on the left tail as well, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so what does that tell you? I mean, it, it, the hypothesis to actually reject it's random. Mm -hmm. right? But it, I, I don't know how to interpret that, but that's just some interesting, interesting question for people to think about. Okay. Well, let's uh, thank you, Chen Chen Jen. Thank you. <laughs>